Hello, everyone. I'm Mohammed Tavakoli, the inaugural director of the Elahe Omidyar Mir Jalali Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto. I welcome you all to the third session of Rethinking History, Returning to Archives and Documents, a virtual seminar series co-convened with my colleague, Professor Arzu Azad of Oxford University. Rethinking History is a collaborative project of the EOM Institute of Iranian Studies at the University of Toronto and the Invisible East Program and the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Oxford. I am grateful to Professor Arzu Azad for this inspiring initiative. In addition, I would like to thank Professor Jeffrey Khan for accepting our invitation to share with us his archival research. Finally, I'm grateful to Roshan Cultural Heritage Foundation and Dr. Elahe Omidyar Mir Jalali, who has joined us here today for their exemplary support of the Institute. At the outset, and before we introduce our speaker, I'd like to express our collective gratitude to Canada's Indigenous people and acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Vandat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Credit River. Today, this meeting place continues to be the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to live, learn, and teach on their ancestral homeland. Professor Jeffrey Khan, our speaker today, will be introduced by my colleague, Professor Arzu Azad, who will be also moderating today's session. Professor Azad. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Tavakoli Tari. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And it's wonderful to see uh, so many colleagues from around the world participating today. Um, it's been a really exciting, I think, journey that we have both embarked on where we've tried to bring in approaches to documents and archives across the wider Iranian world, if you want to call it that, from uh, med the medieval period right up to the present. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, the first uh, talk that we have where we're going to delve into the eighth century. And um, we're going to hear about documents that are not written in Persian, uh, but in Arabic, but from our region nonetheless. Um, so maybe just to introduce myself, I'm Arazu Azad, and I'm a senior research fellow in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, which used to be called the Oriental Studies Faculty. Um, in Oxford, things do change, um, and this was a miracle that we managed to change our name. And um, I'm also uh, directing a research project in Oxford, which is funded by the European Commission and the British Arts and Humanities Research Council, in which we are studying documents um, from in six different languages from what's today Iran, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan. So it gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Jeffrey Khan, who's been who's been an immense, huge inspiration for many of us but absolutely for our project, The Invisible East, we use his work on a daily basis. Uh, he has really set the standard for so, so many of us around the world. So let me give the formal introduction, please. Um, Jeffrey Khan is the Regis Professor of Hebrew at the University of Cambridge. He obtained his PhD from SOAS in London in 1984 for a thesis on the syntax of Semitic languages. His research in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic. In the field of Arabic, his main published research has been on medieval Arabic documents. He has edited various corpora of documents, including Arabic papyri from early Islamic Egypt, documents from early Islamic Khorasan, and documents from Fatimid and Ayyubid Egypt that have been preserved in the Cairo Geniza. 
He's currently working on documents from the Fatimid period that were discovered in Qasr Ibrim in Nubia by the Egypt Exploration Society. It gives me great pleasure to uh, pass the parole, as they say, to Professor Khan. Professor Khan, the floor is yours. If you'd like to share your screen, please do it now. Right. So thank you very much, uh, Arazu and Mohammed, for that uh, uh, very lovely introduction. Um, and it's a great pleasure to see everybody here. I wasn't expecting so many people to turn up, but it, it's very, very nice to see you all. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen. I'll, I'll, I'll get started. Um, okay, so, um, right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the corpus of documents, uh, Arabic documents from Khorasan, uh, i.e. modern Afghanistan, um, which I had the privilege to edit um, some years ago. Um, in fact, the years are going by now. In fact, uh, I, when Arizo asked me to give this talk, I had to go and remind myself what I, quite what I'd said in that uh, publication. Um, but uh, I, I still think that these documents are, 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 are remain a very important uh, corpus for the field of um, Arabic documents. Um, now, when one talks about primary sources, that is to say primary uh, Arabic documents, um, original documents, of course, um, Egypt is the main place where these have been discovered. And, and, and certainly until the discovery of this Khorasan corpus, the, um, the vast majority of, 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 of medieval Arabic documents uh, were, for, were discovered in Egypt. Uh, first of from very early Islamic Egypt, from the, all the way from the first Islamic century uh, and the, on papyrus, and then you had papyri for the first three centuries of Islam, then there was a shift of paper. But there was very, very few, few documents from outside of Egypt. I mean, from this early Islamic period, all the Let's up to the Middle Ages, the first, say, five Islamic centuries, we had some material from um, Palestine, Syria. Uh, then as we get later, of course, the Mamluk period, we've got the Harams collection, and we've got various other collections from Central Asia. But from the early Islamic period, uh, until the discovery of this Khorasan corpus, there, there was very little material. Now, one of the few things which had been discovered, it was this famous letter published by Krachkovskaya and Krachkovsky to Russian um, Arabists in 1934. It was a, an Arabic document dated to uh, um, the hundred of the Hijra, um, discovered in Tajikistan in Mount, Mount Mul, um from the Sogdian ruler Divashti to uh, the uh, Muslim Amir al Jarrah ibn Abdullah. Now, as you see, it's, it is fragmentary, but there's still a reasonable amount of text there. And already from this, we um, learn a lot about uh, the state of Arabic documents in this part of the world at that period. Now, I have to say, I'm essentially a philologist rather than historian. So I get very attracted to philological details of documents, but I, I hope I can show you this evening that attention to the philological structure of documents can tell us a lot about uh, history, answer a lot of questions about historical questions of, of socioeconomic history in particular. Um, and one of the things, for example, in this document already, we see is that in fact it looks very much in terms of its formulaic structure, it looks very similar to Arabic documents, which were Arabic letters, which were discovered in um, Egypt from the same period. So um, this is uh, say it's a letter, it's a sort of it's a petition, uh, and the structure is, is very very similar. Obviously, the content is relating to a local local sort of um, administrative relationships in that part of the world, but uh, the formulaic structure is very similar to 
Egyptian uh, letters from that same period. So that immediately tells us something about the um, how to explain this. I mean, this can only explain from a with a linguistic model, i.e., radiation of, of documents from a center to the periphery, uh, and um, and crucially, the fact that the Arabs, as they expanded across in, in their conquests to the east as well as to the west, that we we're concerned about the east, they were not taking over documentary formulaic traditions of the local areas, but were bringing with them their own traditions of writing. And that, that's the an important insight from studying original documents. Uh, perhaps I won't dwell too much on going into too many details because I realize there is a time limit and perhaps not all of you are, are Arabists, I don't know, but um, just to say that um, there's this parallel in, in various aspects with structure. Also the script, by the way, there's a lot of parallels in the script. Um, so I'll, perhaps I'll pass on. Now, since that was published in 1934, um, by the way, I mean, I got very... Uh, <laughs> Those of you who are interested in the uh, history of scholarship, I mean, Kraczkowski, of course, wrote this, well, of course, I don't know if you know about this, but he, he wrote this fascinating autobiographical, autobiography, essentially, about called Among Mar Arabic Manuscripts, in which he describes his excitement when he discovered this document and, and, and identified the, the various people in it with, with for people you found in Tobari, and, and anyhow, it's, it's very interesting. You should read that book. I recommend it if you, if you don't know. So, but since then, a number of other small fragments of documents in the in in the same sort of area of Tajikistan were discovered in recent excavations in the place called Sanjar Shah in Tajikistan, which is really just down the valley from Mount Mur, uh, and these are datable to quite early as well, uh, early second century. Um, and the fascinating thing about these fragments is that they're on paper, uh, which is very early, um, the early documents. In Egypt, paper doesn't appear until really um, fourth Islamic century. The first three Islamic centuries are typically are the so-called papyrus period. Then we get paper appearing. Um, but this actually, this is a, a sort of a theme, which I think we'll see in most of the talk this evening, is that a lot of the innovations or developments in documentary culture uh, be, are, are, uh, appear first in the East and then spread from in, to the West. So certainly the, the use of paper in documents is one of these features. Now, obviously this is because paper originated in the East, um, and it spread gradually to the West. According to various literary sources, it seems to have appeared in uh, Iraq in the third century, and then eventually Egypt in the fourth century. Um, but so there was a there was a sort of movement of, of, of East to West, essentially. And um, now the the main corpus I want to talk about this evening is this corpus of um, documents from Khorasan, which I edited, uh, and these. Uh, were in, uh, are in the collection of David Khalili, uh, he's a private collector. And he, and as is the case sometimes in these types of collections, the actual origin is not recorded, uh, but from the contents of the documents, it's clear that they came from some region around between Balkh and, and Bamiyan. And in fact, they do seem to be mainly uh, from the region of, of Rob which is a, a, um, a district which is frequently mentioned in the document. So from the contents, we can get some general idea of where they come from. Now, they, unlike the piece we've just seen, the Krachkovsky piece, which was excavated, and the other pieces from Tajikistan, and also unlike the vast majority of Arabic documents from Egypt, these documents are generally in a, in a sort of very, very good condition and without any kind of tears or lacunae and without any fading and um, in fact it's quite remarkable that they're written on parchment I should say um, but 
it's quite remarkable that you know the parchment hasn't been dis discolored in any way. So I think it's essentially um, a um, uh, um, due to the fact they must have been preserved in some kind of protected container or something like that. So, but we just don't know. We did that's just an assumption. Now, a large we. we a large proportion of these documents, there's 32, I think, documents or 30 something, I think, I, I, uh, in the corpus. Um, and uh, a large proportion of those are tax receipts, of land tax in particular. The others are, tend to be various sorts of legal documents. Um, we have a few manumissions of slaves, and we've got a some documents relating to marriage and then we've got some documents relating to um, land survey for example and some um, yeah but the, the, uh, the majority actually are tax receipts and when I first saw this I thought well you know how can a tax receipt be of any interest <laughs> but I began to realize, particularly when I'm drilling down into the philology of this, that these tax receipts can be really exciting from a historical point of view. Um, now, um, the first thing to say is that here we've got number one of the corpus, it's dated 147 of the Hijra. So these this, this is essentially the, this is, I think, I'm not sure the earliest, but this is sort of, this is the area of the, uh, the chronological sort of time time of, of, of this corp, essentially the earlier Basid period, the time of Al-Mansur, Caliph Mansur. Um, so this is a tax receipt for Kharaj, and you can see Kharaj, yeah. Again, perhaps since we're not dealing with specialist Arabs, perhaps I'll, I won't go through the whole text and what time, but this word Kharaj is there. Now you might think, so what? However, 147 of the Hijra is very early. In fact, when I published this, it was, as far as I could work out, it was the earliest mention of the word Kharaj in a, um, in a, in a certainly in the tax receipt. Um, and there was, I managed to find a papyrus in St. Petersburg, which was unpublished at the time. Which was dated 150 of the Hijra, which mentioned, which referred to Kharaj, but this seemed at the time, 147 of the Hijra, this one seemed to be the earliest mention in the docu documentary source, i.e., therefore, the earliest attested form, because literary sources obviously are later. Um, and uh, um, so, okay, that what's the significance of that? Well, the point is, this is one of the many features which seem to have. Uh, appear in the east first and then spread to the west so there's a sort of a movement of documentary and administrative terminology from the east to the west and showing that essentially Khorasan in the east in the Abbasid period at least was the um, heartland if you like or the, the powerhouse of, of the Abbasid empire of the administrative machinery and um, this is where often it, 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 um, innovations in administrative formulae and, and, and terminology started, and then they spread west. They spread west, it seems one of the vectors of spreading was there's a, there's a movement of Iranian administrators to Egypt. We've got references to those in various sources. Um, and uh, Kharaj was, it seems, an innovation of the Basid period in, in, in the Ministry of Terminology. Um, it's referenced to Jizya and early in the Maya sources, but Kharaj is one of the many administrative innovations in, in of the Basid. Um, now, I might be out of date now. I mean, I'm glad that Christian Mula is here because perhaps in his big database there may be reference to a mention of Kharaj earlier than this but um, uh, uh, when I publish this document this is far, uh, this what I could um, establish um, I shall probably not um, I shall probably press on actually because um, this is just an English translation gives you an idea of what this um, the sort of structure of this document um, 
that um, yeah, um, th th this is essentially um, a doc. This let's just quickly read it. This is a document from Yusuf ibn Abdullah and Al Hassan ibn Warazan, the financial administrators of the governor Ibrahim ibn Yahya, whose district, whose jurisdiction is over the district of Rob, Samangan, and something, some other place they couldn't identify. So basically, this was a document issued by. Abbasid financial administrators who were gathering taxes at Kharaj at that time, Kharaj being land tax, of course. Um, and these administrators were under a governor, and but these administrators seem to have essentially Arabic names, but some of them seem to have some kind of Iranian genealogy, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, so we're dealing here, I think, often with local Iranian Iranians who possibly underwent conversion, perhaps. Um, so now, in the same group of documents which came to David Khalili, there were a lot of documents in the Bactrian language, which, of course, obviously is a, is a Iranian language written sort of script based on Greek. Now. I'm not going to talk about these because I haven't got time and not the expert either. It's Nicholas Sims Williams who published this um, corpus. But essentially, these also are obviously incredibly important um, as being the first sort of real major corpus of Bactrian language apart from anything else. Uh, but they, uh, and they overlap chronologically with the Arabic corpus. This one's 103, uh, this one's 154. So that's very much well into the Basid period overlapping with Arabic documents. Now, as I say, I'm not going to go into the content of these, but one immediate, just one brief note about how they differ from the Arabic documents, not only in obviously the language, but the point is that their whole codicological structure is different. Crucially, they have this feature of many of them are so-called double documents. This, this is it's a sort of a feature of documents in antiquity. And also, you know, in in the medieval, in the sorry, in the antique um, Near East and perhaps Hellenistic sources um, of writing a document twice and sealing one of those copies um, as a sort of safeguard against falsification, and um, so that is an ancient custom which has continued in the local production of Bactrian documents in Khorasan. Now that was never used in the Arabic corpus showing that the Arabs did not take over this practice. They, so they, they didn't take over local customs, they brought their own uh, documentary custom with them uh, uh, and also terminology and formulas. And essentially this, the origin of these, I mean, very briefly, one can trace the origin of many of the documentary formulas of the Arabs to, to Arabia. In fact, uh, some of the, we got evidence of certain basic formula, this aspects of structure can be traced back to the Hejaz. Um, but a lot of the, 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 the details of the legal formulas began to sort of develop in the, in the Shuruh schools and, in the early Abbasid period. And of course, they, these then were transferred to the East, in Iraq and, and Khorasan. Um, okay, so we also have a number of other Pahlavi documents. Um, sorry, I talked about um, Bactrian. We have Pahlavi documents as well from this region. One is in the Khalili collection, this one here, which is published by Dieter Weber. Uh, it's not completely clear, I think, what the date is, but um, um, that, by the way, indicates that Pahlavi would have been brought in. This is, a, this is an administrative document of some sort, um, but it's, Pahlavi was not obviously the local language. It was, it was a language of sustaining administration, and this was therefore must have been brought by either speakers of Pahlavi or at least administrators who somehow were trained in the Sasanian Pahlavi tradition, who somehow migrated to Afghanistan or Khorasan. Now, 
Now this brings me to some of the looking a bit more closely at the of the, of the onomastics of some of these um, financial administrators or mayors. Um, we've got here one of this is another tax receipt. We have um, Al Amir Abi Ghalib ibn Al Isbah Bad. Uh, now Isbah Bad is uh, Isbah Bad is an is a Iranian term referring his administrative term, um, which was part of the Sasanian administration. But here it, it's used as a personal name. It seems it was originally it's some well the way i ex, i explain it is that in the sasanian tradition administrators typically remained in families uh, the, the administration was sort of a was passed administrative posts i should say were passed down in families and so it's possible that this this sort of turning of a administrative term into a personal name possibly reflects the fact that this was in this particular amir had had ancestors who were I mean, he himself is presumably now Muslim, but he had ancestors who were Iranian administrators. Um, uh, so I'll probably move on. Um, he's, um, uh, this particular mir, this is just to give you some contextualization, is from, he was had jurisdiction over Madar and Rizm. These are also areas around Rome and that sort of area between Balkh and Bamiyan. Um, now, I could dwell on some of these formulas, but perhaps I won't actually, because I think we've got, we haven't got time for that. Um, okay, now, okay, one thing in formulas here is that if you look very carefully at the development of these uh, formulas, tax quittance, quittance tax receipt formulas, you find that as the time develops, the um, this 152, you do get innovations. Here's one innovation: is that suddenly I think this is the uh, 152 is the first document. This is the first document to start adding this phrase: "Inika a data ilaya." You have delivered to me in Masara Lake in Kharaj, Sanat Kadamakale. So you have delivered to me what is you owe of the Kharaj of such and such a year. Now. That's what it's saying up here. Now, this is an innovation. But the, the interesting point is that it's, um, it only reaches Egypt. As far as I can see, again, is when I did this work. Uh, again, I haven't checked all the latest databases, quite frankly, but it, it, it didn't appear in Egypt till the third century. So we've got some kind of administrative in, um, innovation, which has spread from east to west. Uh, and it only appears in Egypt at a later period. Um, so that's the English translation. It's also <coughs> over Madan Rizm, the governor. Um, okay, so you notice, by the way, and this is the point of the next slide, that with no witness clauses. Um, now, and this applies to all forms of legal document. This is a, a receipt but uh, in legal documents as well, uh, they have no witness clauses. So um, the, um, and this is, but they do have these bullae. And what, very interesting, and this is, this is one of the bullae, and if you look carefully at the bullae, you can see that they have been printed on them. That's the Sasanian iconography. This is obviously a star, with moons, sort of astral uh, iconography. Um, and then they have various other forms of iconography. This is actually a legal document, in fact, with various witnesses. And instead of writing explicitly their autograph witness signatures, <coughs> they write a bullseye and they either impress their thumbs or they write some sort of seal impression with very often the Sasanian style astral or um, iconography. Um, I mean, just very briefly about witness clause. I mean, basically, legal documents were witnessed from early Islamic period, from the beginning, but they 
it was all orally it was all oral witnessing and typically there's references to witnessing uh, orally but it's only really in the third century where we start getting or late second century that you can start getting it witnesses writing down their formulas writing down their doing a writing in a so-called autograph witness clause so um but the, so this is still we're in the early period so you wouldn't expect witness clauses there i mean it's a different story i haven't got time to get into it now but uh, i will in question time if you like um so the point is uh, here, here we've got some animal iconography actually as well um uh I see Judith Lerner's with us, I mean, she's the expert in these kind of things. But um, I believe she told me these, these are Sasanian rather than local Bactrians. So um, these are animal iconography. Here's some of these astral images. Uh, they also occasionally get Arabic names embedded in these, these uh, more Arabic words. Uh, yeah. Now, the point is these kind of star like uh, imprints. Uh, ended up by being transferred to the West, probably without people realizing what they were, as a sort of mark, a, a sort of a, 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 an authentication mark of administrators in Egypt, Barsid administrators, and then I think obviously you can post the Barsid. But they wrote this in pen, this sort of star-like thing you see at the end. And that's that. my hypothesis is this is simply based on these, so saying, you know, astral images and it became a more means of authentication uh, here's a few more examples these are this is a papyrus this must be third century egypt and uh, berlin papyrus again third century egypt we've got the star here um another one okay now here's a one of the corpus is a land survey document by the way that 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 spread of the star to the Egypt is another case of east to west sort of spreading of documentary culture. This document is uh, records the uh, measurement of land, a surveying of land for the purpose of tax, tax land taxation, uh, which is the how the Abbasids um, measured or calculated tax. Um, Probably I won't dwell on that. Um, only um, perhaps again, the names can be quite interesting. Um, we've got uh, some of these names. I mean, often it's one of the ancestors in the genealogy is clearly Iranian. Jundad is a is a is a, is a local name basically. Um, God given by Jund, the God. Karwal um, ibn Mir. Karwal uh, is possibly a Turkic form. So uh, this indicates, I mean, the point is that there's a lot of ethnic groups in this part of the world. I mean, there's Iranian speaking people, obviously, but there, are, there were Tur Turkic speaking peoples as well. Um, in the history of the region, there's a lot of Turkic people. I mean, the, the it's even possible the Hephthalites were Turkic. I mean, we don't know. I mean, some probably in the audience, somebody knows better than I do about that. But anyhow, some of the names do have Turkic type of uh, nomenclature. Okay, so apart from Kharaj, these tax receipts also re refer to a number of other taxes. This is uh, this, this tax. This this is a receipt for the tax of Kharaj plus the expenses of the animals, the pack animals of the uh, postal service, and also uh, portions of expenditure of the land and, 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 and salaries of the, of the postal service and, and, and messengers and, and their accommodation there. So there are lots of these su supplementary taxes often um, mentioned. Um, and it's quite fascinating that there's also um, mention of the supplementary tax for Ta'am al-Mahdi, for the, the, the food or the provi provisions of the, the al-Mahdi. Now, al the, the Mahdi in question seems to be the, the person who became the caliph al-Mahdi. But at this point, 148, he wasn't caliph. Uh, Mansour was still on the throne. 
and Mahdi became caliph in 158. So, but he was serving in the East, it seems. He was campaigning in the East um, at this time. So, but you see how these taxes, taxes were also ex, you know, extracted from the local population to, well, to support the military, the Abbasid military. Uh, here's some more supplementary taxes. It's tax expenditure for those who have equipped themselves Il al Mahdi, those who basically join the army uh, and need, need funding for their, their provisions, those of the army, those who have joined the army of the Mahdi. So you can see it's quite an insightful sort of, um, sort of tax. So now here's a legal document. And um, we've got a, um, this is a very, uh, 145. The point about this, again, I won't go into all the details, but it, I got very excited about this because it, as far as I could see, it's one of the earliest, of the, what at the time at least, it was the earliest attested form of a so-called warranty clause with this form, mer adrakika. I mean, this, this air, You've got an Aleph there, it seems to be sort of redundant, um, plenty spelling, but this is Adraka. This is referring to the so called Darak, which is a term used to refer to the claim of a third party. So it's basically a warranty against that. Uh, if there was a claim of the third party, you know, the, um, the person who's undertaking the transaction is liable to to clear the claim, and he uses the term fa'alei as the first person here, khalasabu, and it is my duty to clear it, i.e. The, the claim. Now, khalas is a, a, um, khalas is a, um, a very interesting term. I mean, obviously it's an Arabic term, but it actually occurs in, um, sorry, it, it occurs in, uh, um, it has actually pre-Islamic roots. It, it's actually first, the term khalas, the Arabic term, it's first attested in the Nabataean document, that is a pre-Islamic document written in Aramaic with that Arabic loan word in it. Um, and uh, it seems to be basically, um, it, it's a term that's developed on the model of um, uh, other more ancient Near Eastern sort of terms. The very, I mean, <laughs> this is the sort of the Arabian context of the Islamic legal formula of tradition in that it seems to have begun in already in pre-Islamic Arabia. Now, khalas, I mean, just to take you very briefly through the history of khalas as a, a, within warranty clauses, it, uh, well, well, before I do that, I'll just look at this slide here. Just some bit of information about these terminologies to give you some idea of the background. Darak seems to be ultimately borrowed from Aramaic. Adde may also be modeled in some model of Aramaic in, the, in the terms of delivery of tax. And, uh, well, we'll skip that one, but Kharaj ultimately has a pre-Islamic background, ultimately going back to Akkadian, it seems, but the form Kharaj ultimately goes back to an Aramaic form, Halakh, which came through various Mid, came through Middle Persian, it seems, Harag and Kharaj. So um, it has an ancient history. Um, but it was only the Abbasid who started really using this as an administrative term rather than jizya, as far as I can see. Now, but going back to Khalas, Khalas gradually was, was changed in the wash warranty formula. You see from some of the Sharut manuals that it was sort of replaced by other forms, particularly those. Uh, in the in the main urban centers, like when I worked in the Karaganiza documents, I found that Khalas was not used in that warranty. They were in the in the Cairo for start area, the warranties were based on the Sharut manuals of, of Tahawi, it seems. Uh, it was in the prominent Sharut, Hanfi Sharut for scholars. But they um, you can find some reference to Khalas in some of the documents further south in, in, uh, in Fayoum, for example, uh, in the Middle Ages. But very interestingly, as far as I can see, the latest version for 
the document that contains the form chalas. Now, perhaps Christian can check in his database, but it, it's found in the, the corpus I'm actually working at the moment from the right and the periphery of the Islamic world, of the Islamic world in the Nefasmi period in Qasr Ibrim, which is in now submerged in the Lake Nasser, but it's, it was in Nubia on the very periphery. Aswan was the boundary of the Islamic world in the Fatimid period. And this document is a, a, a document lease and it contains in it a, a, a warranty which contains the um, formula of Khalas and is dated 518 in the Hijra. And as far as I can see, it's the latest. So we have this interesting situation. We've got the earliest attestation in the, in the Islamic East on the periphery and that moved west, but then it survived for the longest period in the, in the periphery in the Islamic West, if you call Egypt the West. So that's the dynamics of movement of formulas. I think I don't have to go through that because that's basically the Ibrahim document. Then very briefly, because I see the time's going by, we've got some interesting documents of, of emancipation of slaves here, yeah, um, that is to say, uh, <coughs> spon emancipation by masters or slaves. Uh, we've got another itq. By the way, the whole formula, <coughs> seems to have its origin in, in, in Arabia. And my hypothesis is that he actually developed from a lapidary kind of monumental formula whereby legal documents were originally public monuments and the hair that was referring this was referring to the monument itself and it's only gradually got transferred to written documents as document documentary culture developed so it's showing you know the arabs brought this tradition from arabia ultimately and this is then it, it sort of radiated out to east and west and uh, we have one document of Muketaba, which is a sort of a, a um, contractual emancipation. And uh, there's a very long document, this one, with a list of witnesses, but no signatures. They're all put their fingers on steel or seals on the bulla. Um, and finally, probably I'll say something about script. Now, if you look at the script of these documents, this 158, this is a, this is a, a tax receipt. Um, it looks very cursive um, and more cursive really than you would expect from um, Egyptian documents at that period. Um, and my one my hypothesis, which I'm not 100% sure about, but one possibility is that since the writers that we've seen that we have a lot of Iranian, the, the writers, certainly the administrators seem to have Iranian background and so some of them seem to have connections with the tradition of the uh, uh, Sasanian tradition of administration. So it's possible, and we, we have a Pahlavi document here. And Pahlavi, of course, those of you who know Pahlavi realize that these documents, from these sort of ministry documents are very, very careful with a lot of ligatures and very difficult to read. I mean, um, here's another one from, these are from the Islamic East very cursive and it's possible that the, the this cursive cursivity of these documents in the Abbasid tree, the Arabic documents were ultimately could have been influenced by, you know, this substrate of Pahlavi ductus. Because this is what happens in the history of scripts. If you can, like Hebrew script, the Middle Ages was influenced by Arabic in certain parts of the Arab world, if they, be, they became more cursive. Now, this is, the, this is the sort of state of, well, this is the Umayyad period. We've got, in Egypt, we've got very sort of far more square type of scripts. And this is the Basid letter written in the Umayyad period to actually found in Fossil Breen as well. But you can see it's far more, less cursive than second century of G Egypt. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the end of the second, end of the second century. And, it's not quite as cursive of the one we've seen, so it's possible. But of course, this cursivity then moved into Egypt again, and I think it's probably all part of the same trend of movement of east to west. 
Yeah, so I think probably I'll stop there because uh, this is just a Persian document from the Khalil collection, which I think you all know about. This is it's another story, uh, but I'll 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 stop. Uh, I'll stop. Um, thank you so much. This was a real tour de force through um, a hugely complex set of material that, I mean, you present it now and it looks it looks uh, you know very much digestible, but it's a huge amount of work that's gone into deciphering this. And I can again only salute you and congratulate you for for achieving that. And I'm I'm so grateful that you've gone back to this material. I know that you've moved on from this material, but um, really appreciate that you've done this for us. So. Um, I've got a, a number of questions, but I think there are some people amongst us here who would like to who would like to uh, ask some questions. And I, I have some here in the chat and please do send your questions in the chat, but also feel free to unmute yourselves or raise your hands and then I will ask you to unmute yourselves. Maybe that's a bit more organized. Um, so. Maybe we start with, um, well, I, I mean, comments made by Christian and Judith, uh, by all means, why don't you, Christian, unmute yourself um, and kick us off with that, and then I'll go to Judith, and then we have some questions. Christian? Well, I, I answered about the, the Haraj uh, mentioning in the documents. So the, the, the point for me is that uh, the Khurasan documents are the oldest. So we don't, from the Arabic documents concerning this, so we don't really know whether there are, whether this moves from the east to the west. I mean, uh, we can we can see that um, they are they are referring to, they are using a, sp a specific terminology, which is which is great because it is it, these are the first attestations to a certain kind of. Uh, uh, practice, let's say notarial or uh, legal document practice. Um, I, about the, the halasa, or what do you say for the, for the halasa or hulasa? Um, I have seen it in later documents in a very specific way of using it to get, uh, to, to, to finalize a repayment of a, of a debt or things like that. So we would probably have to distinguish the meaning of it and the, but for the as you you said for the for the warranty the darak I did not come across this. This is right. Mm. Just to say this as a question, I don't know whether you would have other questions me concerning. I would like to have a I have a comment on the witness at the station, but this is a long story. Um, shall, shall we come to that or? Yes, please. I mean, on the east to west question, maybe we could give uh, Jeffrey the opportunity to respond to that. Uh, well, yeah. Well, thank you, Christian. Um, I uh, I have to admit, you know, I, I'm not totally up to date. I mean, you you, you have um, this wonderful database of yours. I mean, I well, I'm glad to hear that you haven't found Cholas in a, in the warranty uh, beyond the, that date, because uh, I think it fits nicely with this idea of peripheries. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know. The eastern periphery is innovative, but the west, well, the southern Egyptian periphery is, is conservative. So, so. so, I mean, what do you think, if, if we were to go with your theory of the east to west transmission of administrative practices, can you maybe think of or talk us through how you think this might have happened? I know you're a philologist and this is a historical question, but do you have well, any... <laughs> um, I would say that we do have references to it. Persian administrators in you know, Basid Egypt, you know, the, the Basid pointed administrators, uh, Persians, who I think there was some riots because of them at, at some point. Um, I mean, Gladys Franz Murphy talks a lot about this in her book on uh, career administration. And so, I mean, uh, that presumably is the obvious way of the vector of transmission. And of course, this would be where, how this sort of like Sasanian iconography got involved in you know presumably I mean there was that was tradition was brought from mm. but through administrators I, I'd say yeah um, and I mean also centralization of course I mean the bosses were great centralizers um and uh, so it, they were driving the sort of spread of, of the formulas um 
So it, it was the cent centralization of the um, Basid uh, bureaucracy, which is um, important. Uh, um, and um, well, another factor was just, just general documentary culture, mass production of documents, all these receipts and everything. All that drove major cultural changes in the Islamic world. I mean, and this is what I believe is one of the factors, not necessarily the only one, behind the gradual increase in literacy and use, writing things down, and ultimately had some role in, the, you know, the use of writing the shahada in, in, in written form, ultimately, I think. But again, it's a big question, the shahada, so perhaps we can deal with other things first. <laughs> But it is, you're right, it is incredible that in the 8th century you have documents from Tajikistan all the way to Egypt following the same formulae, the same formats for writing certain types of documents. Yeah. So um, I will uh, pass the word to Judith because um, she she commented on the on the bullai and I would like to add maybe Judith if you could explain to us what you make of these bullae that have this mixing of what looks like Sasanian iconography, if, if I understood it correctly, with Arabic names. And so this mixing of different approaches to, to this kind of documentary practice. Judith, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yes, I have. And um, here I am. And thank you, Jeffrey. Um, every time I hear you speak on, on, the, on the Khorasan documents, it makes me think even more deeply about the Bactrian documents and the later ones and how we how they overlap. And the one that you showed that begins in the name of God that has a single sealing on it, um, and it's only of a single seal, is almost a kind of transition from the double documents of the um, uh, the pre-Islamic um, Bactria, where you the the ceilings, I do not call them bully. I, um, this is a matter of terminology, and uh, people have different ideas about it. A bula to me is a lump of clay that has several seal impressions. But these are individuals who have put their individual seal on a small piece of clay that has been pressed on the knot that has um, sealed one half or the, the main document. And then what is left hanging is a copy of the document that is sealed. And so th there is a formula the way this is done. The, the uh, two contractors put their individual seals, one on each lump of clay, and then the witnesses, no more than five, although we have examples from elsewhere in, in the Hellenistic world of, I think, or in Egypt, um, up to eight or nine witnesses, and sometimes they share the same lump of clay. Um, and so we have different witnesses. Uh, witnesses are also mentioned in the documents, but and so we know that these people were there all on the same day and authenticated this document. And what is interesting then is the single document that begins in the name of God um, has only one seal on it, one lump of clay, and it's a very interesting lump. Um, I get involved with shapes of pieces of clay as well. Uh, but it's round and it's quite thick. And there is a single seal, as I said, and it is of this very elongated, very elegant feline, which I have various theories about this and one day I hope to write about it. This is an influence coming from the East. This is not a Sasanian um, feline, or uh, it looks more like a panther, it's, it's, or a maneless lion. Um, and then we have the bully on the Khorasan documents um, that contain many seal impressions. And these, this is the Sasanian method. So they have borrowed 
um, they've taken from the Sasanian Chancery. And after all, um, when you have conquered such a great territory as is Iran, and you have to install officials, but you have to continue uh, various legal transactions and uh, practices, uh, this gets transferred from the Sasanians, I think, over into Bactria. And that's what I was trying to say, and I'm sorry I misspelled for us. Well, thank you very much. As I always learn from you, Judith, about some field that I'm not very familiar with. Yeah. Thank you. That's fantastic. I'm going to, I, I will come back to the question in the chat, the next one, and I'm going to, um, I don't know whether Maya Schatzmiller or Pavanipur Shayoti had their hands up first. I don't know which one, so I will let you unmute yourselves, whoever is first. Okay. I'm uh, unmuted. May I please. proceed? Of course, please do. Okay. So I have uh, comments and questions related to some of the topics we already mentioned. Uh, to Jeffrey, first of all, uh, the paper that uh, you found is not an Arabic paper. It is a Chinese paper. And the Schenker and Alia uh, group uh, who studied the same documents, the Mount Mug documents are Chinese paper. They're not the Arabic paper. And it's very clear to find out when you put it under some uh, chemical uh, examination. So we don't find the same paper at this early stage. There's a Chinese paper that kept arriving into the Middle East up to a certain point and stops afterwards. And then we see the evolution of the Arabic paper in Egypt that is completely done on material, which is linen rags, and it's again a different thing. So this would play into the diffusion of technology and diffusion of terminology that we are all interested in finding out, the haraj and so on and so forth. My question to Jeffrey, if you can answer me or anybody else, if we ever see Arabic paper in Khorasan, if we do see this Arabic paper eventually in later documents, this is my, uh, my question precisely to this one. Another point that I want to raise, uh, you raised the question of the uh, witnesses. We cannot see witnesses appearing with signature because the literacy rate at this time is very low. Uh, Arabic literacy took a while, I would say 200 years, and also dependent to a very large degree on the diffusion of paper, of course, which make uh, writing material very cheap. So all of this, we see later on people signing documents because literacy rate is higher. The other interesting thing, and I'm familiar very well with the whole set of documents uh, published by uh, Jeffrey Kahn, this uh, indeed very interesting uh, documents. Most interesting is the question of the uh, Um Walad, who is being uh, released from slavery. Because in some instances, not all Um Walad, according to Islamic law, are automatically uh, franchised. And this one is. So it's indeed very interesting. I'll, uh, um, I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll try and answer some of those questions briefly, Maya. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your observation about the paper. Yes, I'm, I'm not an expert on the, the physical sort of quality of papers, but thanks for those remarks. I mean, uh, as for other, well, I'm not, the corpus I worked on from this early Basit period is it's all on, on nether, basically. It's not, uh, there is, you start getting paper and I think the next, group of documents would be from, from the Khalili collection, would be the Persian documents, which is slightly later. But um, um, I mean, Arazu and a team probably know more about this than I do, actually, in terms of generically when paper is first attested in Khorasan. Um, yeah, I mean, as for witnessing clauses, I mean, uh, I'm very, I mean, you're right, it's all connected with literacy, uh, but there are other factors as well. I mean, for example, you know, um, it, um, there was a, uh, 
uh, initially it was regarded as being, well, for, for, for several centuries, of course, an Islamic legal tradition that is written, um, oral testimony is regarded as the most authoritative and, and reliable and only day as it de facto became accepted to actually write have legal documents validated by written witness clauses. But I mean, it was, I mean, it was, well, part of it, the literacy was the product of a greater um, kind of use of writing, which I was alluded to earlier, that the fact that, and I think one of the product, one of the factors was the greater massive production of documents in the Basel period. It, I mean, this has the historians of medieval England. I remember reading once that um, there's a theory that literacy increased or, or due to the sort of the expansion of bureauc bureaucracies. And, and I think this is this sort of expansion, this bureaucratic culture of the Abbasids uh, probably was driving this with the archival culture as well. So that was, um, that was another factor. I mean, also there was the underlying uh, whole phenomenon of, of, of the Sharut scholars, what their innovations and their, their sort of their creativity in creating um, new Sharut formulas, which was, um, I think was, a lot of it was inspired by pre-Islamic models. Uh, I've shown in, in my earlier publications, which um, I've forgotten a lot about those narratives, but they, they do show, I, I try to argue that that the Sharut scholars in Iraq, for example, seem to be drawing some traditions of formulas, even from Aramaic Jewish sources, um, because some of the terminology like Adrachta for Darak, is the model for Darak, is only basically found in Jewish Babylonian Aramaic in the Babylonian Talmud. And it, it's, and the point is that witness clauses, the whole culture of writing, witness writing, is also a pre-Islamic tradition. It's, it's, it's the found in Byzantine and also in, um, in an Aramaic culture. And, and I think that the main drivers of the main substrate, if you like, a lot of a lot of the innovations in as, as was um, the Aramaic culture of, of Iraq rather than the Byzantine Greek culture of Egypt, because it was Iraq was the powerhouse of change in the advanced period. So I think there were various factors at play in creating this, this sort of, this, if you like, literization of the oral testament. I mean, it, it's, and I've just mentioned some of it. Um, I think Christian, I'm sure has got more to say about this one. I mean, uh, I was, I'm not sure there any other questions, were there? What, what was the other question? I think probably are. I think you covered quite a lot of it. Okay. Maybe if I just um, quickly, I mean, I'm not a paper expert either, but I've been looking into it. And this book has just come out and it's been recommended to me by paper experts as the new final word on, on the, tra the transmission of paper technology uh, and of step forward from, from the previous work by Bloom. And it's called Hath Koras. H A T H Koras History of Handmade Paper in South Asia, but it covers uh, the Islamic hate world as well. Um, but just to say that um, we don't have that much uh, empirical evidence yet to to say when the Arabic paper arrived here. Just to answer uh, Maya's Maya Schatzmiller's question, but what I wanted to also offer and let you know is that we have a paper study going on right now. Um, of the um, Bam, what we call the Bamiyan papers, what the National Library of Israel calls the Afghan Geniza. And um, we're waiting, uh, expecting the results um, within the next month. Um, so we want to know exactly this, where the paper was made. And the dating of these documents, those that are dated is between the 11th and the early 13th century, early 11th to the early 13th century. So hopefully we'll have some answers on, on that. Um, so next I have, uh, who has waited very patiently, uh, Parvana Pushayati, please unmute yourself. Thank you, Arizijan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Khan, for this, um, as I said, uh, to the force in one hour. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Um, I, I have one comment that, you know, Sasanian 
iconography is such an essentialist term and uh, covers so many various uh, substrata of iconography in itself that uh, I find it a little bit too broad a, a, a definition. But um, I'm very, very interested in the fact that uh, you say that the kharaj, that the word kharaj has been first used in what I call near to Khorasan at least, right? which is very, very significant that all your documents are coming from there. And I'll ask a, a question about that. But the kharaj, does this mean that the first time that it appears that it is the first time that it was used? The reason I'm asking is that, as you know, for explaining Abbasid revolution, all kinds of scenarios uh, have been put forward vis-a-vis -vis the Kharaj. So if you can um, kindly elaborate on that. And the second question is, well, you know, a lot of Arab uh, conquests and original garrisons were located in the Tukharistan area, in Samangan and the, the, the places that you um, mentioned. And, uh, and, and, and these, were, these were stationed there, I believe I will be writing about this, primarily for, uh, for trade between China and uh, South Asia. Um, and it, it has to do with the nature of the Abbasid revolution, which I think it was a um, mercantile revolution. Um, so those two, if you could comment on um, anything that, yeah. Thank you yeah, so much. Um, yeah, I mean, um, regarding Kharaj, I mean, it's uh, basically, I mean, it, it's, it's an ancient term, um, but, uh, and in fact, it's, as far as I can establish, at least, it, 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 was, it, it was used in extant original uh, legal uh, documents or docu administrative documents, first in the Abbasid period. I mean, in the Umayyad period, it was used, jizya was used. Now, in the literary sources, like these sort of like histories or the, well, fiscal histories like Abu Yusuf and all these sort of forces, you'll, 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 you'll see references to Kharaj, which have retrojected into the Umayyad period. But wow. the, the point is, the, um, the question is really, is that what was the term being used in reality? I mean, the, the problem with the history of administration is that often these later sources tend to retroject histories into, you know, Kharaj you know, terminology into the early period. Um, so what happened, I mean, part of the Abbasid sort of innovations, were in, not only in, in administrative formulas, but also in, Terminology is that they they would often um, create new administrative formulas, very often on the model of the Quran. Actually, I mean that's one of the factors. I mean, for example, they replaced in the very early documents of lease uh, in in papyri, they would use the root karai, erdeme akra, or other way, basically to lease to lease something. But in the Basid period, they started introducing this, this form Ajr or Istajra. And that is ultimately, I mean, the point is, you know, it, it's, it's an Arabic word, it, but, it, and, but it, it's one possibility is that that's the this terminology that's found in the Quran. And, um, um, and you know, there's, so it's something to do, there's, a, there's an innovation in the Basid period. I mean, it's, it's um, and I often think, you know, in a more, historical kind of contextualization of this. I mean, when, you know, when there's a power, a change of power, there's all kinds of emblems of change. I mean, sometimes you build an enormous building. Sometimes you can change the script, you know, talking about documents. Abdul Malik and the Maya period seems to have done the same, that particular thing. You would kind of consolidate your, the emblem of your power by some kind of, uh, some kind of innovation in, public innovation and I think the advances, you know, the change of terminology was part of this culture. So that's one, that's one thing. Uh, as for the, what the Arabs were doing in, in Tajikistan, I think perhaps um, I'm not necessarily, you, you know more about than I do. I think Ofer Haim has joined us so much, he can probably tell us about that. Ofer has, but he unfortunately can't speak, um, but he's oh. listening. 
Um, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, but uh, may, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Khan. Please, I, I I don't know whether you have written about this or not about the terminology of kharaj and it's uh, yeah, but please write about this because it is really incredible. It, this is, I mean, if you're right, this has all kinds of implications vis-a-vis um, -vis the theories that uh, that have been put forward in explaining Abbasid revolution, um, which I think is just, um, you know, uh, coming out of the imagination of authors who have who are who write about this. So. Yeah, please write about it. Well, yeah, I mean, as I say, I say I'm not, you know, I'm a philologist, but I get excited about words. But I always regard the word, like kharaj, as a term, as, as equivalent to an enormous mosque or cathedral like the Normans were building. So this is the change of stamp of power. So, uh, yeah, so I think that's, anyhow. <laughs> Thank you so much. If I know Christian and Judith, I'll come back to you. But if I may now, uh, some people have been waiting patiently. Um, who have, uh, uh, and I'm going to read out Lawyer Ziyayi Big Delhi's uh, question, and she can't speak. She says, uh, but I think it's a good question, and it takes us into uh, the theme of language. And uh, I'd really love to hear uh, Jeffrey's thoughts on this question as well. So Lawyer writes, um, this question might be beyond the topic. I was wondering if we can address the issue of Arabic literacy with the documents existing in multiple local languages. What is the rate of Arabic literature, literacy in the eighth century? Also, had there been a publication of the epigraphical analysis of the scripts and these documents? Right, yeah, well, interesting question. I, mean, I did try to an analyze the script in my book. Um, so I think if you can look at that book. Uh, by the way, it's, it's, it's on academia, so you can download it. That's right. I'll send the link for the, the whole book is on Jeffrey's. I now academia. only publish open access anyhow, but in those days, I, it was anyhow. So you can you can see. Now, as for the issue of Arabic literacy, well, I think it's connected with something you know, I think we were talking earlier in response I think, to Maya's question. Um, you know, there was obviously an increase in literacy, but this was we're on the you know just on the cusp, and we're on we're not actually. It was the third century where this massive increase in use of writing at least developed i mean this was it was not only literacy as i say there are various factors involved and, and it was just a shift from a, a more oral based culture to a more written culture i mean this is i mean uh, you know gregor Scherler has written a lot about this that, that, that you've got the early 21st and basically in my opinion you know like hadith and poetry were authoritative, most authoritative transmission channel was in oral transmission and, and writing was only for private notes. But then there was a shift in the, uh, basically the Abbasid period where writing became more common and hadith started to be written down and, and, and poetry being written down more. Um, and um, though this, what was going on was that this, the, the, the the, the, the Abbasid sort of secretaries, the, the, the caretivers in, in the Abbasid court were, were quite happily writing probably before Hadith and poetry became really sort of sanctioned in, 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 in authority of written form. So the actual move from a more oral base to a written culture seems to probably have Iranian sort of uh, roots you know, uh, in, in a way. Uh, that, that, that's, that's one thing. But but, you know, there are other factors I mentioned already, perhaps, you know, the, the, the fact that this massive increase in bureaucracy, I think, was a driving force in, in writing. So, that. so mm -hmm. yeah, that's briefly how I respond to that. Yeah, thank you. I know it's a huge question, but, you know, it does. This is just a wonderful uh, example of how you had lots of different cultures, different languages coexisting in what we call the Iranian world. So I oh, yeah, I didn't answer that bit about multilingualism. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, because we had multi-ethnic groups in the Basid, in that Khurasan of that period, and uh, they were clearly converts. I mean, some of these names shows that they must have had uh, Iranian ancestors, converts to Islam. You know, the, the later generations of Arab uh, names, and uh, but they must have retained 
you know, bilingualism at least. And uh, um, but what's interesting from a documentary point of view is, is not so much the bilingualism, but the substrate of other features, mm-hmm. because the Arabic formulas are coming up from the from the if you like the center. I mean, there are a few possible cases of uh, it's Iranian influence on these documents, but basically. What interests me are things like the substrate of, of the script, the part of the script, and also this, you know, the phenomenon of seals, for example, that's obviously a substrate. Mm-hmm. Um, but only certain substrates were tolerated. You know, they, they didn't take the whole formula tradition. They're not imitating the factoring documents of it in terms of the formula, but certain, if you like, peripheral features like ceiling and script form that knows of what got influenced yeah. thank you so much um christian please before you need to rush off if you can still spare yeah, some thank you yeah i'll just try to, to wrap this up a little for the for the presentation because we made this kind of a comparison of the documents and we find that before uh, the one, 170 uh, literary date no witnesses are written after the date. They are all in the text, and the text is written by one scribe, at least according to the documents we have, and you have published most of them. It's not only in, in, uh, the, in the Khurasan. We have one, one document uh, from the papyri who has the same style. So I think this is an Abbasid tradition of doing things concerning the notarization of legal of transaction. I think, I think this is, these documents are court documents although the, the Qadi is not named, but this is, this is not a, a private transaction. And this becomes later, uh, with later uh, um, papyri, and where we have uh, a new style, when we see that the witnesses, first the witnesses are named after the, after the date, and then they, they are written, they, their name is written by the scribe at the first part, and then later on, and this is the, the, the ninth and 10th century uh, common era, then they write themselves. And I think this process is linked to the professionalization of the, of the, of the limit of who can be a, a, a witness. Uh, in the beginning, there is no limit to who becomes a witness. This can also be non-Muslims and things like that. And then you have this Adal, the, the, the honorability of the witnesses. This, this is uh, discussed in legal, legal um, lit- literature. So, so um, the question, it's, it, I think the signing the documents is less a question of literacy uh, than a question of the changing legal system. But I would, I would acknowledge that when you are a witness and you have to write, this is an impulse for being able to write. So there might be some links we, which we don't really know yet. I, well, I don't know. It's very, it's very short now. And I'm, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to run away. I don't know whether you want to say something on this or whether there's, there, there's something which is not clear. What I yeah, well, I basically agree with you what you're saying, Christian. I mean, I think you, I mean, you've described it you know, correctly, the development. I mean, I'd only say that there's this interesting few documents I've, well, some, one of them are published from the end of the second century, where there's a reference to the saying there was no autograph signatures, but there's a reference to the fact that there is a document. What was it saying? Um, he, the witness, wrote his document of shahada or something, but there we there was no autograph signature. I mean, my hypothesis about that. Some article I published in Jowls recently. Was that in fact this? I linked that up with the Scherler theory that there was a gradual development of private writing. Uh, then there was eventually official writing, as it were, of like hadith and poetry. But so there was a sort of private writing of shahadas before it became official, and that was the, the that was the transition point. And in fact, I found one papyrus, which I think is probably one of these private sort of shahadas. Like, you know, I kitab to fi kitab, you know, I, I wrote in this and such a document. I mean, and yeah, so it's possible, you know, we've got this transition of gradually private writing of Shahed is then eventually the official writing. But I agree, it's not, as I, was, I think I was saying earlier, you know, it's not all to do with simply literacy. 
it's to do with models, it's to do with the Sharut, it's to do with underlying substrates of like, I think the Hanafis were influenced by, you know, pre-Islamic models of Sharut or, or formulas where, you know, it was quite acceptable to sign. Um, so I think, and it was just innovations in, in Sharut practice. And as you say, you know, absolutely, you know, our system became official and, um, yeah. But, um, thank you so much, Christian. Thank you for your patience. You. And <laughs> nice to have you. Uh, Judith, you're next, I think. This is just a, a very small comment, which in a sense has been already touched on. But to be a witness, you don't have to be literate. And certainly, um, as long as your name and your seal is on the document, that is all that is necessary. And we see that in the Bactrian documents. And there was the official who probably read out the contract or whatever the document pertain to. And then everybody nodded and they affixed their seals. I mean, it was rolled up, at least the Bactrian ones, and then they affixed their seals. Even in the 12th century documents that we are reading in Persian and Arabic, it, it always differentiates. And I know Jeffrey also saw this in the Cairo Geniza documents between the name Bechatihi and Be'amrihi. So Bechatihi, is probably in his hand, and Ba'amrihi probably at his order or her, well, his, it's always his order. And we assume that perhaps that means that the person wasn't literate, but still gave a witness statement and someone else wrote it for them. So you're, yeah, I agree with you. Thank you for that, Judith. And uh, Maya, next. Just a very quick comment to this issue of literacy. Greek literacy is 5% of the population. Roman literature is a bit higher, I would say seven to 10. These are recent studies. My assumption is that Islamic literature was higher than that, probably in the teens, maybe 20%. What is significant about the Islamic literacy is the fact that we go beyond literacy of the clergy, right? Don't forget that all of us Islamic scholars are working on the, on the religious production. Uh, so it's a very limited thing. But what we have, we have, for example, manuals, technological manuals, artisan manuals that indicate nonetheless that people of middle class or working class had nonetheless access to literacy and could indeed read and write books. Uh, Conrad Hirschler, published a very interesting collection of uh, signatures. And I really would like not that people should not really undermine the fact that people sign uh, as, as a sign as, as, uh, of, of literature. We do have uh, a great amount of people signing their name as an indication that they could read and write and listen to the discussions and, and discover. Just to conclude, uh, there is a methodology in which pre-modern societies can be estimated in terms of their literacy. This involves evaluation and comparative of the um, population level with regard to the number of books that were written and manufactured in certain cities during a certain period. And I'm engaged right now in such a, a project with a Moroccan colleague who uh, began to assemble such literature. So the more literature we have, and we have so many books, but nobody ever bothered to count them. Once we start counting our books, we're going to have a better access to the question of literacy and numeracy as well. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds like an exciting project to look out for as well, the findings. Um, so then I have just, I think one last one from, is M.A. Johnson still here? Are you still here in the call? Yes, I am. Oh, would you like to ask your question, please? No, it's just in the in the talk. Um, there's conversation about paper and uh, papyrus. And I'm actually, I do medieval Slavic manuscripts. And um, uh, the Slavic and Byzantine Greek have a third type of writing support, which is um, bombazine. 
and that's thought to be made of some sort of hemp. And I was wondering if you have that in the Arabic tradition, although it would be later than some of the documents um, that being discussed today. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I'm probably not the first to ask, I'm not an expert on writing supports, only to say that what I know about Islamic papers that is based on um, and material, cloth, it, it was just, it was not, not paint, it's not based on uh, wood, wood pulp or anything like that, it's based on, on um, the material cork, which is sort of mushed down, um, which I'm not sure is hemp necessarily, I mean somebody else might know this, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, I've just given the reference to this to this book that's just come out a few years ago. Um, it might help you, uh, M. A. Johnson. Sorry, I don't know your first name. I hope, I hope that's helpful. Mm. Do, you, do you know I've already ordered it <laughs> on Amazon for the collection? So thank you very much. Wonderful. Which collection is that? Uh, it's the Hill and Our Research Library at oh, Ohio State yeah. University. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Nice to thank nice. Thank you. I think we're gonna we've 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 really abused abused your your generosity, and I'm so so grateful for your time and for answering all these questions and for sharing all this wonderful work with with us. And I think everybody, yeah, lots of uh, clapping and everybody is grateful. Mama John, I give you the final word uh, on this. Thank you, Lars John, for moderating such a great session. And thank you to Professor Khan for this intellectually inspiring and highly learned presentation. And to all of you who have made this, who participated in this session and have made it uh, uh, such a great communication and discussion. We look forward to seeing you uh, at our next presentation that would be on Thursday, July 20th. And our very own Professor Arzu Azad will be speaking on the village and the archive on documents in Iranian languages, 8th to 13th century. I wish you all a very wonderful day and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.